The early 20s was an era of jazz, flappers, and gangsters in America. The prohibition gave power to speakeasies, bootleggers, and gangsters to rule over the underworld, changing the American culture forever. Let's take a look at the untold stories of speakeasies and bootlegging. When the Roaring Twenties started, the United States had just entered Prohibition, a time when booze and other alcoholic drinks were not allowed from 1920 to 1933. Americans with an urge to drink were determined to obtain a drink by any means possible. By 1925, historians speculate that as many as 100,000 illegal bars were operating in New York City alone, with some serving just the wealthy and powerful. This resulted in the establishment of illegal speakeasies, and at one point, it was estimated that there were more than 100,000 speakeasies in New York alone. The term speakeasy emerged in the 80s, but suddenly they blossomed as they never had before. On the other hand, in Detroit, close to the Canadian border, smugglers used false floorboards in automobiles, second gas tanks, hidden compartments, even false bottom shopping baskets and suitcases, not to mention camouflage flasks and hot water bottles, as one account has it. The name Speakeasy comes from a time when consuming alcoholic beverages was illegal, and consumers were advised to speak easy, quietly, when placing their orders at the bar. A password, secret handshake, or hidden knock was necessary to enter these underground watering holes. To further evade detection by law enforcement and nosy neighbors, slang terms for alcoholic beverages were invented, such as coffin varnish, monkey rum, and tarantula juice. These illegal bars were also known as blind pigs or gin joints. They were often run by criminals like the famous Al Capone. The locations included anything from jazz clubs with dance floors to shady backrooms, basements, and even newly designed rooms specifically for the Prohibition era. It was common practice for speakeasy owners to bribe underpaid police officers to ignore their businesses, buy them drinks on the regular, or inform them of upcoming raids by federal prohibition authorities. Because of the prohibition, event planners had to get creative with how they moved and stored the booze. Many secret bars pretended to be pharmacies so they could sell alcohol for medical purposes. Some people moved the illegal alcohol from one event to the next using phony books, coconut shells, garden hoses, and even strollers with their children seated on top. The federal Volstead Act criminalized speakeasy owners rather than clients who consumed alcohol at these establishments. When police or federal officials conducted searches, the smugglers often went to considerable efforts to conceal their alcohol supplies so that they wouldn't be seized or used as evidence in court. At the 21 Club on 21 West 52nd, the owner commissioned the architect to design a customized camouflage door, a secret wine cellar hidden behind a false wall, and a bar that, at the touch of a button, would send liquor bottles down a chute to crash and drain into the cellar. Women and girls up until the end of World War I in 1918 were required to dress, speak, and act according to traditional Victorian norms. The passage of the 19th Amendment, which granted women the right to vote, occurred only six months after the implementation of Prohibition in 1920. This was an important turning point that offered women more freedom in their political expression. Before the establishment of speakeasies and this new way of life, women had no business being in bars unless they were performing as a showgirl. However, now that they had this access, social and liberal change were in full swing in the jazz age. At these gatherings, men and women drank, danced, and smoked equally, something unseen in pre-World War II America. Many people held jazz music responsible for the immorality that resulted from women's newfound independence. Flappers were a symbol of the decade, representing the increasing confidence and freedom of women. By the 1920s, going to a speakeasy wasn't as radical as it once was because more women were wearing shorter skirts, driving their vehicles, smoking cigarettes, and voting. The most prominent speakeasy, Texas Guinan, who ruled as the queen of the nightclubs in the 1920s, was a famous hostess and performer. She was the owner of several New York City speakeasies, and her trademark welcome was a cheery, hello suckers. She was an attractive and powerful figure in the club world, who worked in dozens of films. For alcohol to reach speakeasies and individual drinkers, it had to be smuggled into the country. During Prohibition, people who smuggled alcohol were known as bootleggers, and they often used secret compartments in cars to do so. Rum from the Caribbean was the most common alcoholic beverage. Rum runners smuggled into the country. 
The enormous manufacture of automobiles during the Prohibition era allowed bootleggers to quickly adapt their vehicles to new legal markets. To make their automobiles faster and better able to avoid detection on dirt roads, bootleggers soup them up by adjusting the axles, shocks, and tires. Therefore, bootlegging is often seen as the momentum for developing motor racing in the United States. Due to their bold and resourceful actions, bootleggers gained widespread fame and glamour. William Bill McCoy was a rum runner whose illegal booze was so high grade that it inspired the expression, the real McCoy, meaning something exceptional. A highly glamorized picture of the 1920s was generated by bootleggers and flappers working together. As a result, many ordinary people of the time longed for a lifestyle that was more action-packed and risk-taking. New York City led by mobsters like Salvatore Maranzano, Charles Lucky Luciano, Meyer Langsey, and Frank Costello emerged as the nation's bootlegging hub. There were an estimated 32,000 speakeasies in New York City during the height of Prohibition in the late 1920s. Former bootlegger Sherman Billingsley opened the trendy Stork Club on West 58th Street. Famous authors Dorothy Parker and Robert Benchley frequented the Puncheon Club on West 49th Street. The club in time was located next to the infamous Polly Adler brothel in Midtown. The famous Cotton Club on 142nd Street was owned by mobsters Oni Madden and Frank Costello. Other hooch joints could be found in apartments in Harlem. When congressmen needed a drink during Prohibition, they went to George L. Cassidy, the most reputable bootlegger on Capitol Hill. Cassidy made up to 25 deliveries of illegal alcohol per day while freely roaming the corridors of Congress. The man in the green hat is George Cassidy. He was the chief bootlegger to Congress during Prohibition. They actually give him an office uh, for the first five years, 1920 to 1925. He works out of the Cannon House office building. And then in 1925, he got arrested and uh, had a very, very brief jail sentence and then shifted over to the Senate side. And he worked for five years out of, out of the, the Russell Senate office building. Due to the poor safety provided by the Capitol Police. From a tough leather briefcase, he delivered bottles of whiskey, moonshine, scotch, bourbon, and gin for five years. With the help of his political connections, he secured an office in the House of Representatives. The press began referring to him as the man in the green hat. After his arrest in 1925, when he was caught trying to deliver six quarts of alcohol to a House member while wearing a light green hat. Cassidy admitted guilt and immediately shifted his legal activities to the Senate office building. Cassidy became so infamous that in 1930, Vice President Charles Curtis had a dry spy from the Prohibition Agency observe him from the Senate stationery store. Cassidy was caught with six bottles of gin and a client's list. When Cassidy was arrested for the second time in February 1930, he essentially reached a plea agreement with the judge, whereby he agreed not to bootleg anymore, and he was good to his word on that. And in October 1930, he published five front page articles in the Washington Post. He got a year in jail for his crime. Cassidy claimed he was responsible for 80% of Congress breaking prohibition laws. Whether for better or worse, prohibition altered the drinking habits of the American people and left a lasting cultural mark. Industrial alcohol was a common source of alcohol for use during prohibition. This was the same type of alcohol used to create ink, fragrances, and camp stove fuel. For financial reasons, several people started peddling dangerous compounds like carbolic acid and selling moonshine made from a still. The harmful substances such as smoke made of pure wood alcohol were responsible for the deaths or injuries of thousands of people who drank them. To cover up the taste of their poorly distilled whiskey and bathtub gin, speakeasies added elements like ginger ale, coca-cola, sugar, mint, lemon, and fruit juices to their cocktails. In doing so, they contributed to the widespread popularity of the mixed drink known as a cocktail. One of the famous drinks, the Bee's Knees, was a gin-based drink that used honey to ward off unpleasant flavors. And the last word was a gin-based drink that mixed gin with chartreuse and maraschino cherry liquor. Mixed with rum and red grapefruit juice, the Mary Pickford cocktail was created in the 1920s. Even after Prohibition, some people have abandoned the traditional meal in favor of the more trendy cocktail party. American distrust of the 18th Amendment was fueled by several factors, including the prevalence of speakeasies, the brutality of organized criminal gangs competing for control of the liquor racket, and the high unemployment and the need for tax revenue that followed the 1929 Wall Street crash. 
The Prohibition era ended in 1933, when the 21st Amendment was ratified, giving way to fewer but legally authorized bars where alcoholic beverages were subjected to federal control and taxes. This was the first time in our nation's history when a constitutional amendment nullified its predecessor. With the revolution of alcohol, gangsters, and women, prohibition was a period that deeply impacted and somewhat changed American society. Forensic science innovations and crime scene analysis techniques paved the way for even more arrests, inching society closer to safety. This ends our video for today. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to the channel to see more historical adventures.